Welcome, everyone. My name is Alex Holobar. I will be uh, the lecturer today. Uh, for those that don't know me, I'm an expert in extraction of the physiological parameters. By no means, I'm an expert in the statistical uh, processing. So uh, the purpose of this webinar is basically a gentle introduction to accuracy assessment of motor unit identification from high density EMG, regression analysis with linear mixed models, and Bayesian linear regression models. So basically in the next hour, uh, I will guide you through our understanding of these three tools. Uh, we prepared quite a lot of uh, examples in MATLAB code, in uh, R code. So we will be using R Studio, we will be using MATLAB, and uh, mostly we prepared uh, data sets that can be used as a playground of um, statistical models, okay? Um, so let us begin this quest. Um, a few words about Hibit Neuro project. Basically, it's a, a coordinated supported action supported by uh, European Union and the UKRI uh, in the field of hybrid neurosciences. Basically, from the scientific viewpoint, we focus on hybrid neural machine interfaces, the one that record uh, electroencephalograms and the one that record the electromyograms, uh, both surface and uh, intramuscular recordings uh, are being covered. And since this is a CSA action, it has a lot of outreach activities, right? So we will do the exploratory research project. We will organize two summer schools. Uh, we organized one already workshop in, in at Imperial College London uh, last summer, and uh, the next one will be organized in Barcelona one week from now, and I will invite to participate uh, online or in person to that workshop also. We will organize eight webinars. This is basically the first webinar in a row. Uh, we will... Um, form the biomedical signal data repository um, containing at least six databases so that uh, freely available that the researchers can play with. Uh, we will organize massive online open uh, course or mock. Uh, we are intensively preparing the activities of uh, International Hybrid Neuro Hub where we could exchange uh, the ideas and boost uh, our ideas and uh, many more events uh, were already organized or will be organized in the two years that, that uh, remain to the end of the project. Uh, partners involved uh, include Imperial College London, Chalmers University from Sweden, uh, Technical University from Catalonia uh, in Barcelona, and University of Maribor. Uh, Highly welcome to visit our web pages, uh, to follow us on social medias, and um, I hope you will uh, enjoy the content that we will prepare. As I mentioned, next week, uh, February 6th to 9th, uh, there will be a workshop, uh, a journal into the brain activity, BCN24. Uh, uh, you have an agenda of the workshop here and uh, there is still time to, to register uh, either online or in person. Uh, we have uh, many, many persons already registered, so I think it will be a very, very uh, happy event and very fruitful event, so uh, cordially welcome to join us. And a bit further down the road, uh, this summer in July from 8th to 12th, uh, we will organize in Maribor summer school on hybrid neural interfaces um, covering different uh, interfaces from surface intramuscular uh, high density EMG to uh, EEG and functional brain connectivity, corticomuscular coupling, uh, movement augmentation. So there will be keynote lectures, practical examples, student to, to student explanations, uh, present your project challenges and so on and so on. Uh, again, uh, highly welcome to, to register uh, already. All these events are uh, free to participate, uh, so registration is free. 
uh, but you need to to cover your travel and accommodation costs um, and we are trying to organize it in a such a manner that these costs would be affordable to to everyone right so uh, stay tuned for future events but today we will be talking about uh, the validation of the results uh, as I said, a gentle introduction to uh, accuracy, uh, identification, uh, regression analysis uh, with two different schools of thinking. One is linear mixed models and the other is Bayesian linear regression model. Um, although I will do uh, all the talking, uh, Nina was intensively uh, uh, involved in the preparation of the scripts. So everything that uh, is available and will be available uh, on the web page uh, was uh, mostly prepared by Nina Murks uh, and uh, she will be moderating the question and answer session today. So uh, on the web page, you will find uh, basically two scripts uh, covering the MATLAB code, uh, two mostly identical scripts uh, doing the analysis in uh, R Studio, and basically three sets of uh, data, uh, one experimental, I will explain uh, how this was acquired, and two synthetic, one of moderate size and one of the large size. And uh, the synthetic EMG script, this one here, um, allows you to generate whatever you want uh, in the synthetic case. So basically you can freely play with the parameters. And today I will just show you how you can change these parameters. And then later on you can play on your own. Uh, and uh, basically the idea is that you would be able to generate the data and then later on test different statistical models, uh, how good they are in fitting that data and where the potential problems are. Also, the slides that uh, I'm sharing with you today will be available or are already available on the web page under the presentation um, in the uh, left lower corner. So um, as discussed, we are thinking uh, where to publish also the, the form to discuss uh, different, may it be corrections, may it be suggestions, may it be some wonderful ideas. So what we would like to establish is an active community um, focused on the hybrid neural interfaces and uh, uh, issues connected with the hybrid neural interfaces. So um, one more explanatory slide, uh, what you will find in what uh, 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 file. I will not repeat this again, but uh, feel free to read it and, and uh, explore uh, the content of these files um, when you return to this webinar. Uh, let us now go to the concrete topics. Let us now start discussing the, the extraction of the uh, parameters. Uh, we have been doing this for the two decades now, and basically we specialized in the extraction of the neural codes from the high density surface uh, electromyograms. And uh, what we proposed is basically a computer aided technique that uh, takes the recorded signals and extract the spike trains. Each spike in the identified spike train represents a firing of the motor unit. So I will uh, assume that uh, you already know something about the, the uh, anatomy of the uh, human motor system. There are motor units active in the skeletal muscles. Uh, they uh, activate in the discrete manner. So uh, how the body controls, how the nervous system controls the, the force generated by the muscle is by modulating the firing or discharge rate of the motor units and by modulating the recruitment patterns of the motor units. There are several hundreds motor units active in each skeletal muscle and the central nervous system can turn them on and turn them off, okay? There are many, many excellent books on uh, how the motor system and skeletal muscles work. So if you are not familiar with the, them, uh, welcome to read it. 
This will not be essential for the today's uh, webinar, but uh, it uh, surely helps to understand uh, what is going on uh, in the real data. So we are for two decades extracting these uh, neural codes. And of course, uh, once this is extracted, you get the information in the form like this. So here we see an uh, example of the experimental data. This is actually the data that uh, uh, is offered to you in this webinar. So this is one uh, ramp contraction of the tibialis anterior. Uh, you can see that uh, uh, the force, accepted force, increased from 0% uh, maximum voluntary contraction or MVC to the 30% of the MVC and then back to the zero. You can see the recruitment pattern of the motor units. Here, the motor units, each motor unit is depicted in a different color. And each vertical bar is a firing of a motor unit. So you can basically observe the recruitment modulation with increased force and also the firing rate uh, modulation or the discharge rate modulation, right? The discharge rate is not so evident from this. Uh, very slight, but you can always calculate it from the interspike, from the interdischarge firing. You can always calculate the discharge rate, and then you see um, the same data in another form. Basically, you can follow how the discharge rate of the motor unit increases with the uh, with the uh, exerted muscle force. Okay. And the data model, the statistical data model that we will um, tackle today is the following in the Wilkinson notation. So the maximum discharge rate, which is achieved somewhere here, right? The maximum discharge rate is a function of the intercept of the recruitment threshold of the discharge rate at the motor unit recruitment and then there will be some random factors, which I will explain later on, right? So there will be basically just two or three fixed factors, sorry, the intercept as a one, the slope of the recruitment threshold as a second, and the slope of the recruitment discharge rate as a third uh, fixed factor. And there will be basically uh, three or more random factors. Um, now I am explaining the synthetic case in the experimental case. We don't know the grand truth, right? So uh, we will first go to the synthetic case where everything is known, and then we will switch to the experimental case, the experimental data where, well, the grand truth is not known. But the variables that we will observe one of, once again, the output variable will be the maximum discharge rate, and the fixed effects uh, or the fixed factors will be recruitment threshold and the discharge rate at the recruitment, this one. I will uh, later on explain how these uh, parameters uh, have been cal calculated in the experimental case. The important thing to realize is that basically um, a lot of this uh, um, a lot in these statistical models depends on the quality of the parameter extraction. And this is something uh, that uh, acquires or and, and requires uh, all the attention, right? Uh, once we extract the neural codes from the surface EMG uh, signals, basically we need to assess how good these neural codes are, right? In the last decades, in the last two decades, basically we uh, and the, uh, many, many groups around the globe proposed the different measures of the quality, right? What you can do is calculate the energy accounted for by um, decomposition, by the motor unit identification, and this gives you uh, a hint about the representativeness of the results. You can also count how many motor units you were able to observe and we know that there are several hundreds motor units active in the typical skeletal muscle. So just judging from the number of identified motor units, you can get some uh, guess of representat representativeness uh, of the motor unit pool 
behavior. And there is a third metric, uh, uh, so-called pulse to noise ratio, that I will uh, um, explain in more details um, together with the coefficient of variation of interspike interval. So these are the quality control measures, and they need to be applied to the extracted uh, neural codes in order to tell something about the quality of the physiological parameters that are being extracted from these neural codes. You can then, once you get the neural codes, you can then uh, estimate the motor unit synchronization, you can estimate the motor unit excitation level, uh, neural drive, coherence, synergies, uh, adaptations to various interventions and uh, like uh, fatigue or pain or training or rehabilitation or whatever you want. And of course, uh, the quality of the extracted parameters will depend on the quality of extracted neural codes. And this quality control is highly essential. Uh, also in the statistical modeling of the results. Once you have everything under control, basically you go to the application and you do what you want to do with the extracted data, right? So today we will basically work with extracted parameters. In our case, this will be the maximum discharge rate and the recruitment threshold and the discharge rate at the recruitment of a motor unit. They are very simple physiological parameters because the focus here is on statistical models and not so much on the extraction of the parameters. Okay. Pulse noise ratio, as I promised to explain, is an energy ratio between the pulses that are denoted with these red circles as a discharges of a motor unit and the baseline noise, basically, which is everything but the spikes, right? From here, the name pulse to noise ratio, and it is a metric that belongs to the, to the uh, signal to noise ratio family. So it is expressed in decibels. It can be applied to each and every motor unit, and uh, basically the higher value uh, reflects the better uh, quality. Uh, we showed one decade ago that this pulse noise ratio correlates very well with the sensitivity, correlate, correlates negatively or inversely with the, uh, with the false alarm rate, and this has been shown in synthetic signals and in experimental signals using uh, intramuscular EMG as a reference. So pulse noise ratio is uh, something useful in our eyes, but it comes with some uh, challenges, uh, with some issues, and basically one of the main issues remaining when it comes to the decomposition of the uh, EMG signals is the problem of motor unit merging. Uh, due to the similar properties, uh, motor units, close by motor units in the uh, volume detection of the surface electrodes share the properties. So if, if they have a similar conduction velocity, if they have similar length, similar, similar orientation of the muscle fibers, uh, similar size in the motor unit territory, then they will have a very, very similar contributions to the EMG signals and therefore they will be very difficult to tell apart. Uh, we call this problem a problem of motor unit merging in the estimated spike trains. And in this uh, slide, basically you have a simulation representation of the motor unit territories with the pink ones active during particular contraction levels, so four different contraction levels. The blue ones, the, the one that can be identified from surface EMG, and the yellow ones, an example, just an example of a pair of motor units that merged together, um, producing one spike train. And the separation of these merged spike trains is a quite, quite difficult problem. Nina could tell you much, much more on the how difficult it is uh, to 
to separate them. And she prepared basically two examples uh, for us of motor unit merging, right? These are these spikes that come out as a result of computer aided techniques, decomposition techniques, so that they are in blue. And in red circles, what you have is basically segmentation of these spike trains. So uh, a decision whether the spike represents a firing of a particular motor unit or not. And if you pay close attention, what you will see in this interval from the 15th second on uh, is appearance of another motor unit. Uh, there are uh, increased density of spikes. There is increased density of spikes here, and this tells you, you could zoom in into this spike train and you would see better, but what happens is another motor unit recruited uh, in the, about half away of, of uh, the previous motor unit being active, another motor unit recruited and uh, start contributing uh, crosstalk basically, uh, spikes to, to, the to the identified spike train. Uh, and due to this crosstalk from another motor unit, uh, pulse to noise ratio decreased. So the pulse to noise ratio is below 28 decibels. Uh, usually the recommendation, the recommended threshold is around 30 decibels. But what I am trying to tell you now is that, that you need to be careful how you interpret this threshold, right? There are cases where the pulse to noise ratio could be lower than 30 decibels and they are quite acceptable. And such case you have here, we are able to explain why the pulse noise ratio decreased. We understand what was going on and therefore we are able to make the intelligent decision in accepting this motor unit firing pattern, discharge pattern as a good quality discharge pattern Nevertheless, despite the fact that the pulse to noise ratio indicates the warning, the pulse to noise ratio below 30 decibels is a warning that there is something going on and that the human operator needs to be careful when she or he interprets the results of this decomposition. And another uh, case uh, prepared by Nina where you have a very, very strong, very nice pulse noise ratio well uh, above the limit of 30 decibels. But basically, um, this pulse noise ratio tells you how well two motor units are separated from all the other motor units. What happened here is that we basically segmented contributions from two motor units. It's a very, very evident case that one motor unit contributed uh, small spikes, the other motor unit contributed big spikes. So we are very quickly ensured and convinced that there are two motor units. The pass to noise ratio is high. The coefficient of variation of, of the interspike interval is a mess. So basically, um, Observing the pulse noise ratio is not enough. What you need to do is uh, sit down, go and manually inspect all these spike trains, and then decide what is of good enough quality to be accepted and what is not of good enough quality to be accepted. And this has been done. There are many issues. You can rely on the regularity of the firing uh, or discharge patterns, but then the patholo pathology can destroy these patterns. Uh, and there is certainly a lot uh, that we still need to learn about the discharge patterns of the motor units in the pathological conditions. We are building the databases. We are building the knowledge over the last two decades. There have been 10,000s of motor units identified, but the quest is ongoing. Uh, one more interesting thing, and we are now slowly coming to, to the statistical models. Uh, we also proposed, or it has been proposed, it doesn't matter who proposed it, it has been proposed uh, the tracking of the motor units, right? So you can estimate a filter on one contraction. Filter is something that 
yields the spike trains out of the EMG signals. You can estimate the filter on one contraction, then apply the filter to other contraction. It has been shown and published before, and this means that we could do a pair waste pair race uh, comparison. So we could estimate the filter before the intervention, do the intervention between the, the contractions, record after the intervention, apply this filter again, and we will get uh, the pairwise comparison of the motor unit behavior. And looking from the statistics viewpoint, pairwise, pairwise comparison could be much, much, much stronger than um, unmatched, unpaired comparison, population of the motor units comparison, right? So that's a very nice framework. The only problem is that in the experimental conditions, in the real conditions, the theory is only a theory and that things go wrong. If you test this filter transfer from the different conditions in synthetic experimental conditions, what you will find out is that you never track all the motor units, so that you basically, uh, the tracking, the success of tracking depends on the experimental conditions, and that you start losing motor units quite, quite um, early in the experiment. Uh, much earlier than one would wish. So you have a, a very dense representation of this decrease of the number of motor unit tracking across different contraction levels in this table. So if you start tracking at 10%, then uh, you will lose like 30% of the motor units uh, till you reach 70% contraction. And this is a synthetic signal. You can start at 20, 30, 50 other contraction levels, but these are synthetic signals. If you go to the experimental signals, the percentage of the, the lost motor units will be quite enormous. Basically, um, if you start at 10% contraction in the TBI scenario, by the time that you come to the 50% contraction, you basically lost um, all the motor units that were identified at 10% contraction. All this, how to read this um, table, is explained uh, in open access uh, manuscript here. So welcome to read it. But the take home message here is that motor units cannot be tracked despite the, the every effort that the community is putting into motor unit tracking across the conditions. OK, so paired tests, statistically speaking, uh, are not possible or frequently not possible. You can then limit yourself to the ones that you tracked, of course, but then you are throwing away um, the data, the information in the untracked motor units. OK, let us now go to the statistical um, models. I will start with the simulated data and uh, in the following, I will do a very, very quick walk through the scripts that we prepared for you. So very likely this is not a classical webinar. This is an introduction invitation for you to play with the scripts that we prepared. OK, uh, to my understanding and to the understanding of, of all the Maribor's team, playing with the, the, the data uh, is the best way to learn the things. And if you have a, a simulated data where you can control everything, then you can also test the sensitivity of the uh, statistical assumptions, the assumptions that the statistical models make uh, about the data, and you can compare these assumptions to the, the ground truth, and then you get the feeling about the sensitivity. So. Um, our understanding is that playing with the data is the best teacher. Therefore, we prepared these scripts uh, for you. OK. Um, OK. Uh, again, in Wilkinson notation, what we will be um, analyzing is the, the basically the following uh, statistical model. If you are not familiar with the Wilkinson notation, there are many, many uh, web pages where you can uh, 
uh, read about it, but uh, if you want to to do the linear regression analysis, then uh, being fluent in the Wilkinson notation is is a must. So if you are not fluent yet, go and read and uh, be able to understand this equation, this formula. Right. This is the first essential part that you need to to understand. Then uh, allow me to spend a few words on the, the model that is provided to you in the MATLAB, uh, synthetic MATLAB uh, code. So in the in the file which which uh, has a synthetic emg.m in its name. OK, so what you can play with is the number of subjects, number of repetitions of the contraction, number of motor units that are identified per contraction. OK, uh, here the number of subjects is set to 15, number of repetition to three and number of motor units to 15 again. Then you can set the portion of missed values. So the failure rate of the motor unit tracking across the contraction is something that you can specify. For the time being, it is zero, but you can set it to zero 0.5 and then half of the motor units will be simulated to be lost, not tracked across the contractions. OK, then you can specify the contraction level and in our model that I will present soon, this will also mean that you are playing with the intercept. OK, so there is one variable called C which plays with the contraction level and will play the role of the intercept in our statistical model. You play with the slope of the recruitment threshold factor. You play with the slope of the uh, recruitment discharge rate factor. And then you can turn on or, or off the interaction between those two fixed factors. Setting this parameter to zero means there will be no interaction. Setting it to 0 0.1, it means that there will be a 10% interaction, right? And later on, we will be assessing with statistical models, we will be assessing these values. So this intercept, this slope, this slope, and the level of the interactions between the fixed factors. And what will be playing with us in the multi-level mixed model are the random factors. And these random factors will contribute to the slope of the recruitment threshold factor in a random way. And here we deliberately did not use the normal distribution. So pay attention that, that basically we generated these random factors from uniform distribution. If you want to change this to be a Gaussian or a random uh, normal distribution, then you should just change this rand function with the rand n function. Those familiar with the MATLAB notation already know what I'm talking uh, about. And hopefully those that are not uh, familiar with the uh, MATLAB notation um, will be able to change to make these little changes on their own. OK. If needed, we can then come also with the Python script that generates this data. And the, the data generation is uh, described again in the MATLAB code um, in this slide. Basically, for, for each simulated subject, for each simulated repetition of the contraction, for each simulated motor unit, you calculate the recruitment threshold, you calculate the recruitment discharge rate, you set the intercept of the model, you set the slope, which is formed from the fixed factor and three random factors. You determine the slope of the discharge rate factor, recruitment discharge rate factor, which doesn't have random factors in this synthetic case. We, we did want to complicate the model a bit, but not too much. So we only consider the random effects uh, tackling the slope of the recruitment threshold, but not the slope of the recruitment discharge rate. And the final formula connecting everything, so the output variable, which is the maximum discharge rate, with this intercept and all the slopes that we will try to, to, 
uh, evaluate is listed here. So we colored uh, for you these factors so that you will better uh, read the formula and you will be able to play with it, right? So uh, you have a fixed effects or factors colored in red. You can have a, a random effects or factors colored in blue here. You have a residual, the model residual model here in, in uh, black. So basically this is a random noise. The residual we will see uh, are always assumed to come from the independent Gaussian distribution. And this is very much connected to the central limit theorem. If the leftovers, what the model cannot explain, uh, are really, really random, uh, uh, coming from different sources, then the central limit theorem tells us that their distribution needs to be Gaussian, right? If they are really coming from huge number of different sources, not coming from one or two factors that has, have not been explained by the model, then their distribution needs to be normal and they need to be independent. And this is a central assumption behind all regression models regarding whether they are linear, generalized linear mixed models or uh, Bayesian regression models. These residuals come from uh, from normal distribution, or you have a factor, you have an effect that has not been explained by the model, so you need to readjust the model explaining the, the behavior of your data. Okay? So, um, once more, please use this, play with it, change the number, you can change the number of subject to, to 15, from 15 to five, maybe the, the number of tracked motor units um, to, to 10, five. When you decompose uh, high density EMG signals, you realize that it is rather difficult to, to come up with the high number of motor units. So there is a eternal question, how many subjects do I need? How many, motor units per subject do I need? Uh, and uh, there are a lot of uh, tools to, to calculate the required statistical power, but the calculated statistical power uh, basically depends on the variability of the phenomenon that you are observing. And this variability of the phenomenon is something that is not yet well known when you are, I don't know, at the frontiers of the uh, extraction of the physiological parameter, right? There, there is a gap that, that um, exists between what a statisticians would like to see about the, the power analysis and what we can offer when we are, for the first time, observing some phenomenon that has not been observed or reported be before, right? So uh, there is an eternal question, how many motor units, how many subjects, how many repetitions do I need, right? And hopefully um, understanding the sensitivity of the statistical models will help you to uh, basically to, uh, to understand uh, the sensitivity, yeah, the sensitivity to, uh, of statistical models will help you to understand uh, the number of recordings that you need to to have. Okay, that's the the very purpose uh, of of everything. This script is in MATLAB, uh, but it generates the 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 Excel table or the CSV file that can easily be uh, imported into the uh, other languages. And uh, Nina will now uh, pose a, a set of questions, uh, if she will be able to do so, uh, regarding uh, what programming languages you use. Um, SPSS, or for the statistical analysis, I mean, SPSS, RStudio, JASP, um, maybe Python, maybe MATLAB, 
Uh, there is a, a tendency to use Python and MATLAB when it comes to the extraction of the physiological parameters, but up to now, at least to our experiences, uh, Python and MATLAB have not been used for the statistical analysis. For the statistical analysis, usually researchers switch to other uh, languages. So, um, Nina, everything good on the questionnaire? Is yeah, it running? Everything is fine. Yes. Excellent, excellent. I don't see it, so I rather ask. Um, please answer, and then we will uh, report this um, as a post analysis, uh, and that this will be published also in the in the web page so that, that uh, you will see. If you generate then th this data with the script, uh, you can then track the, the, uh, the distribution of the observed variable, right? Remember, the maximum discharge rate is observed variable, it's an outcome variable of our statistical models. You measure or calculate the recruitment discharge rate. This is something that you can calculate from the identified uh, motor units. You calculate the recruitment threshold. And then uh, what we would like to estimate is with the statistical models is the slopes uh, connecting the intercept, uh, intercept and the slopes connecting the maximum discharge rate with the factors. We think that the maximum discharge rate depends on these two factors, but this is our hypothesis that, that we will investigate. In simulated data, of course, we know because this is something that, that uh, how, the gen how we generated the data. The MATLAB script will also create this kind of plots for you. So basically, this is a very dense plot. Uh, the subject goes by columns. The repetitions of the contractions go by rows. So this is subject one, repetition one, subject one, repetition two, subject one, repetition three. And then you have these lines which de denote the behavior of the motor unit. And basically what you observe is discharge rate, right? So you have a maximum discharge rates on this edge. You have the recruitment threshold on the X axis, and you have a recruitment discharge rate on the Y axis uh, here at the beginning of the line. So basically this line connects what we would like to model, right? Again, we see this, we can calculate this, but we would like to understand whether these connections between the, um, the factors, between the effects and the output variables are statistically significant or not, and what the average slope of these lines is, taking the variability that comes per subject, per contraction repetition, and per motor unit into account. So the last three things will be the random effects in the mixed models. The script will also generate um, some a bit more fancy 3D plots and uh, it will rotate uh, uh, so that you can enjoy a bit more in the data that is being generated. In this kind of plots, uh, each motor unit coming from all subjects, all contraction repetitions is denoted by this black asterisk and the fitted plane, because we are fitting the plane, we are dealing with two fixed factors. The fitted plane is uh, denoted in colors, right? So that, that uh, you can visualize how good fit, how, how, how much the plane coming from the statistical models fits the actual data. Okay, and uh, now let's go to, to, to our codes. Again, two different uh, programming languages. I will do mainly RStudio, but you have uh, two pretty good extent, uh, everything already covered in MATLAB. 
What I find beneficial using MATLAB is that uh, since I do the extraction of the parameters in MATLAB, I can then do a very quick test uh, using the, the statistical uh, tools that are available in MATLAB. Currently, to the best of my knowledge, uh, MATLAB still doesn't support everything that RStudio does, but there are many, many different uh, initiatives uh, listed at the end of today's presentation, uh, which looks quite promising and, and can also be exploited in MATLAB. So maybe there will soon not be a need to, to switch from one programming language uh, in, in uh, extraction of the parameters and uh, to, to another programming language when it comes to the statistical analysis. Maybe it's just a dream, but maybe it's it's um, reality. But never, whatever the, the end result will be, currently MATLAB already uh, supports a very, very quick investigations uh, just to, to know where you stand. So um, I will use the Wilkinson notation. Output variable is maximum discharge rate, and it depends on the intercept and on the slopes of uh, recruitment threshold factor and on the slopes of slope of the recruitment discharge rate factor. OK, and this Wilkinson notation is rewritten in the R Studio syntax and uh, um, basically in the same form rewritten in the MATLAB uh, syntax, right? So um, again, Whatever programming language uh, you use, the Wilkinson notation is the one that you need to know. And we can now, uh, just for demonstration purposes, switch to MATLAB. Basically, let's do MATLAB first. I already pre-prepared everything, so I have the, the data loaded. I read it from the, uh, from the CSV file. Uh, what what I have is the data stored in a uh, table called table one. And basically the columns of this table, uh, I can show it to you here. Okay, the columns of this table have their names. And these names basically are the variables that I see here in the Wilkinson notation. So basically it's very simple to, to model. And my first linear mixed effect model, which assumed that the maximum discharge rate comes, can be predicted from the intercept and from the fixed effect uh, connected with the recruitment threshold. OK, this will be my first assumption. It's a very simple model. It's much more simple than, than the reality. So uh, I expect that the, the things will go wrong and that I will be able to see that the things went wrong. And basically uh, what we can do is plot the quantile plots. If this model would fully explain the, the behavior of our data, then I would see, I would expect this quantile, to, quantile plot to, to fit this imaginary line. I see that tails deviate from this imaginary uh, dashed line. This is the first indication that my model did not fully explain the behavior. You could also plot the, the residuals. So basically this is a residual at a certain um, sample. So this is at sample T and this is uh, at previous sample. This is called uh, lacked residuals. Again, if the residuals would come from a um, big number of sources, they should be independent and that should be Gaussian uh, distributed, so normally distributed. What you would see in this case is a, a circular distribution and uh, not a particular um, ellipsoid like in this case. So this ellipsoid, the lack of the circle, basically indicates that there is at least one factor 
that has not been fully explained. You can also look at the residuals in the forms of the histogram, and you see that this is, well, close to the normal distribution, but not normal distribution. The same thing as already demonstrated in the quantile quantile plot. And you can also see the time structure of the residual. And uh, if there was no hidden factor, uh, unobserved factor, then, then there should be no concrete structure and you can see these fluctuations of the residuals and all this visual analysis is something that you can exploit in judging whether your statistical model captured the behavior behind the data that you have. Okay. Uh, you can also uh, go and see what the estimated numbers of the slopes were and what the variance of the slopes was and so on. We will come back to the estimated numbers later on. For the time being, just uh, switch to the R Studio. I will try to replicate the same thing also in the R Studio. So this is the R code that we prepared. Um, I will go to, so there are many linear mixed models. They are gradually increasing their complexity and Nina commented everything for you. We will not have time to, to, to test them all. So I will rush through these models, but um, you have everything prepared. You can go from uh, the simplest model. So this is this simple model in in uh, R, so I can click here and then control enter and then I run this and I get the summary, the estimated values. I can do the quality analysis until plots. Again, we see the deviation. Not everything is explained by our statistical model. I can do the residual plots. Again, we see that it doesn't form the, the perfect circle, so it is ellipsoidal which means that there is at least one factor not explained. And the R Studio comes with a very nice check model functionality. You need to install the packages, uh, but you have the instructions how to do so at the beginning of the script. And this check model uh, functionality basically tells you many, many things. It tells you how uh, good the predicted model fits the, the sampled uh, values. Uh, it tells you whether or not uh, you have a linearity in the, in the uh, model, whether or not you have homogeneity of a variance, uh, whether or not you have uh, outliers, and of course, whether or not the residuals follow the normal uh, distribution. What I like from the eyes of the beginner is that basically you have the hints here, what you should look uh, after and, and how the patterns should look like. So that basically this basically guides you across the visual check of the model assumptions. And there are quite, um, yeah, you can check the outliers uh, in another function and uh, you can also check the predictions. Um, I don't have time to, to, to explain uh, everything, but um, we just prepared something to, to play with so that you can go on and practice this. So there are quite uh, many assumptions. Normality of residuals I explained in details. Uh, normality of random effects uh, is something that we violated in, in our MATLAB script, so uh, I warned you about, uh, and, and there is this red uh, uh, text a few slides back um, saying that they come from, from the uh, uniform distribution, not the normal one. The, the assumptions about the, the variance and so on, the, the color linearity, there are many, many assumptions that are very often ignored by the researchers, right? The statisticians tell us that, that we need to understand what is behind the statistical models and they have been documented. But uh, to my experience, many, many uh, of these assumptions are, are 
quite often ignored. Uh, and Nina will now pose uh, uh, another set of uh, questions which will ask you anonymously which of these assumptions up to now you almost always considered and uh, which of them are maybe those that, that you seldomly consider or seldomly check, right? This is not, not a contest uh, of, of we do everything right all the time. We just want to see the, the reflection of uh, how the things really are. Uh, I can add that matching this assumption is not always trivial. Uh, and uh, and uh, finding the statistical model that fits your data is quite tedious uh, work. And uh, the nature doesn't care about the statistical assumptions. So to to quite quite frequently to to a large extent uh, what you see is that uh, the experimental conditions violate these assumptions and at the end of today's webinar uh, i will give you the list of the recommended literature and one of the articles that i will recommend is the sensitivity analysis of the statistical models uh, when it comes to violation of this um, assumptions. Okay, so this is a common problem. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that quite frequently we cannot fully meet these assumptions, but understanding the sensitivity, to what extent we can violate these assumptions, is essential when it comes to judging the the results. If we now go and compare in the following slides, and I will be quite quick, in the following slides what we did is compare the results of the same model fitting in our studio and in MATLAB, and you have, if they match to our judgment, if they match, you have them uh, written out in bold green uh, numbers. So the very first very simple uh, model, which we know it's it's not complete, right? Um, estimated that the intercept is 22.5, the grand truth modeled grand truth was 30, and the slope of the recruitment threshold is 0 0.29, almost the one that, that we simulated. We didn't ask it to model the slope of the uh, recruitment discharge rate, so it said nothing about this, right? And both MATLAB and the, the RStudio implementations agree to a large extent, so this is what, what we hope for. If we, based on the residual analysis, say, okay, there must be another factor, uh, and we happen to think about the, the recruitment discharge rate, we add it as a fixed factor, and then we see that the estimation of the intercept improved, the, the estimation of the slope of the recruitment threshold, okay, was almost perfect uh, in the simpler model already, but we got also the, the estimation of the slope of the recruitment discharge rate, and all three factors are statistically significant regardless what tool you use, MATLAB or R Studio, okay? And you can go on, you can start adding the random effects, and here with the random effects, basically it becomes tricky, right? Because you can group these random effects. And uh, there are different ways how you can, you can establish these groups, right? So I will jump um, right on, to a quite advanced model, which says my data was generated from an intercept, from the slope of the recruitment threshold, from the slope of the recruitment uh, uh, discharge rate, and then I would add the, the random effect, but pay attention. Now I'm adding the random effect to the intercept, not to the recruitment threshold slope. So basically I'm adding the random effects coming from the contractional repetition subject 
and water unit identification, but I'm adding them to this fixed factor, and in reality, they should be added to this fixed factor. So I'm adding it to the wrong fixed factor. Nevertheless, the estimated values compared to the to the uh, reference ones are quite accurate, right? I can then improve things because I know the grant truth. I can add the random factors to the slope of the recruitment threshold, right? This is how it should be. And uh, yeah, a slight improvement, but, but already previous estimate was good enough. Let me stress here that, that uh, you really need to play with the number of subjects and number of uh, observations, number of motor units, because it may happen, and I expect that it will happen, uh, that these two models will start to differ when you will have uh, less uh, motor units or, or lower number of motor units and lower number of subjects that, that you can model, right? So even though there are no big differences here um, sooner or later they will they will appear okay we could also go on uh, and and basically um, group the random factors uh, from the motor units with the subjects why why would we do so because when it comes to the naming the motor units, basically we name them per subject. We say motor unit number one identified in subject one, motor unit number two identified in subject one and so on. So basically we name them according, usually according to the subject, right? So uh, in order to fully reflect this, the grouping of the motor unit random effect uh, per subject uh, is in place, and you have uh, such an example in the both scripts, MATLAB script and the R Studio script. But the time is running, and we are already one hour into our webinar, so I need to rush on. We have another another framework, Bayesian regression uh, framework to to cover, right? And the syntax again is quite similar. So basically, you start with the Wilkinson notation. You tell the source of your data, you set the prior distributions, right? Because the, the Bayesian framework um, basically manipulates the, the distributions of the data. So you start with the prior uh, assumption what you believe the distribution of the parameter that you are trying to estimate is, then you basically train your uh, your Bayesian estimator on a given data and you get the posterior distribution. So with Bayesian regression model, you don't anymore operate with the, the significance level. You don't uh, operate with the, the mean value. You operate with the distributions of the values of your parameters. And these distributions, once you estimate them, allow you to calculate whatever you want. You can still calculate the mean value of this distribution. You can still calculate the 95% confidence interval out of this distribution value, but you get a distribution value. So let's go to our script. Let's move down. I would just indicate now to you that the script also goes into the generalized linear mixed models. We were honestly over ambitious when preparing the, the data for this webinar. Uh, you see that I'm already running out of the time. We did play with the generalized linear uh, mixed models uh, uh, also, and you will find them in the in the script, but unfortunately, I am not able to to cover them. So instead, let's run this Bayesian model and let's give the the summary. Uh, as with the linear mixed models, the quality check uh, of 
of uh, Bayesian fitting is also important. I'm now waiting. Ah, okay, compiling stand program. Um, it will take a, a bit of time. Uh, this stand is uh, uh, basically um, sell, uh, standalone uh, product, which can be integrated into the MATLAB environment or into the R Studio environment. And basically, this stand, um, yeah, it is coded in C and C++. So it's a bit more difficult to to install it but uh, if you follow the guidelines on the web page and i will provide you the the link to the web page um, it should be it should be without any problems um, so there are certain steps that you need to apply and then uh, the installation is quite um, quite trivial also for non engineers right and uh, what you basically uh, get let us repeat this because I. What you basically get is the estimates of the factors, effects that you that you uh, um, basically specified in the Wilkinson formula. Now, I would need to add the intercept here, something like that. But you can always skip it, and I was lazy and I skipped it. Uh, but we have the fi fixed factor recruitment threshold, we have a fixed factor recruitment discharge rate, we have intercept, and we have the, the residuals. So uh, with the residuals, they are assumed to be normal. So what you estimate is only the variance of the residuals, right? So you have an intercept uh, evaluated, you have the slope of the recruitment threshold evaluated, you have a uh, Recruit slope of the recruitment discharge rate evaluated, and you have a, a standard deviation of the residuals evaluated. This is what you have. The quality control comes in observing the traces. So basically, what the Bayesian framework does is um, use the uh, Monte Carlo Marco chain methodology to draw samples from the distribution. And it repeats these drawings of, of samples typically several times, typically four times. We call these chains. So I don't know, 10, uh, uh, 1,000 samples being drawn in chain one, 1,000 samples being drawn from the distributions, estimated distributions in chain two, in chain three, in chain four, and if the model converged, if there is enough statistical power to estimate the distribution of the requested effects, then what you will see is these traces being highly random, but uh, basically staying within some range uh, of values. So you don't see uh, big deviations. Uh, the traces need to be random and they need to stay within certain value ranges, right? I know that this is highly qualitative description of, of the quality, but uh, this is how, how it goes, right? Um, as said, later on, we will open up the form and then people can discuss how useful this is. What you can also plot is uh, the distribution, estimated distribution of the of the parameter coming from different chain. And uh, the rationale here is that uh, all the estimations from all four chains need to match more or less. And they do in this case, right? Whatever chain, I have chain one, chain two, chain three, chain four, whatever chain I use for estimation of the intercept uh, parameter, I basically get more or less the same distribution, right? And this is this is how uh, it should be. There are not uh, uh, there are challenges in the scripts that we prepared uh, when going to the experimental uh, um, data. Uh, if you will not uh, use the, the some fine-tuned uh, parameters, you will see that the trace 
the first trace usually deviates from the other tra traces. So it means that in the first trace, the model was still catching up to the statistical properties and did, need, did not fully converge. OK, and you get the warning. That the, met, that the model failed to to uh, to converge, or that the or that the uh, the fit of one of the chains deviated from the others chains. So the Stan and the R Studio are passing a lot of warnings, and then you need to follow these warnings and read the the forums in order to uh, to understand how to get by by this okay so this is the framework in in bayesian uh linear regression and what you end up with is the distribution estimation of our parameters this one is for the intercept it should be uh 30 and it is completely wrong because it's a very very simple model uh and uh, or maybe this one ha huh, sorry this one is already in the experimental condition that's why it's not 30. my bet i should go to the synthetic case here uh so my mistake and uh, these are the the estimates of the slopes coming from the recruitment threshold uh coming from the recruitment discharge rate and from the variability of noise Right, so you get the results in the form of the distributions. Now they are um, quite away from each other, so they are very, very dense, but you can zoom in and exploit it. And then you can calculate the mean value of the distribution and you will get the same result as the as the linear mixed models would provide for you. So basically, when it comes to the Bayesian regression, you need to observe this air hat, uh, air hat, sorry, uh, metric. It needs to be close to one. If it is, um, I don't know, 1.1, it means that the chains did uh, the chains did not converge, and that you need to have uh, um, more data, or you need to have a simpler uh, statistical model. So basically, you don't have enough statistical power to reliably estimate the distribution of the parameter value that you want to estimate. And therefore, if you cannot reliably estimate the distribution, you cannot reliably estimate the moments of the distribution, like the mean value. And then you get the mean value estimated here. Now we are again in the synthetic case. The true value was 30 um for the intercept and and basically with with a highly simple model without any random effect taken into account basically you get uh, um, these estimates you can get, go back to the slide before where this was estimated by the linear mixed models and then you can compare the estimated values and then you will get uh, some feeling uh, how good these estimates are, right? Uh, so there is a lot of comparison that you can do. You can then go up uh, with the complexity of the statistical model. You can add the, the, the random effects. There is a mistake, a plus is missing here. We will correct it. Um, and more and more factors that you add, uh, more accurate your estimates are, but to a certain extent, sooner or later, uh, you will get the warning that, that the model did not converge and that, that there are problems in the, in the fitting of the model, right? And then you need to, to decrease the complexity of the model, right? In MATLAB, you can only model in Bayesian framework. In MATLAB, you can only model the, the fixed effects. So there is no, no mean to, to dis, uh, discriminate between the random effects and the fixed effects. In R Studio, you can use the very same Wilkinson notation as in case of uh, 
in case of linear mixed models. Uh, so basically, you can really compare the Bayesian framework with the linear mixed models framework. If you do this on the synthetic signals, uh, then you will have the ground truth and you will be able to, to see uh, which is better and uh, make your own mind. The same, the very same thing you can apply to the experimental data, but I need like a few more minutes to explain how this experimental data uh, has been acquired just to to be for you to be able to understand what is behind the experimental data. So it has been required from 19 healthy subjects in the tibialis interior muscle, the high density EMG recorded with 64 channels, 16 bit resolution. We decomposed it using the convolution kernel composition technique, and we manually edited the, the results by the two experts. You can think of their names. Um, and these are the, the results of this editing. Um, three repetitions, three exerted ramps from zero to 30% and back down. You can observe how the recruitment threshold, how the recruitment pattern changes. Uh, you can go and observe the, the discharge rates. Um, these are the same slides that I already presented at the introduction of this seminar. You can pay the attention of a very interesting behavior, how the motor units start recruiting, right? And I just brought the attention to two different sets of behaviors. You have motor units that starts with, with a very quick discharge rate, so very high discharge rate, uh, a two consecutive uh, firings, and then a longer pause. And then you have some, these are indicated in, in with uh, red arrows here. And you have the, the opposite motor units, which have one firing, then a long pause, and then they catch up with the, the firings, right? So uh, quite, quite a different behavior, something going on in the data. Uh, and now it depends how you calculate, how you estimate the recruitment threshold and the discharge rate, right? If we would estimate the recruitment threshold from the very first firing, then the recruitment threshold would be the force level at the time of the first firing, something here. But since we have this very, very variable response of the motor units, we decided that we will calculate the recruitment threshold as an average force across the first two firings. And to match this on the level of the discharge rate, we say we will calculate the recruitment discharge rate from the first two interspike intervals, which means three firings, right? This is how the extracted parameters uh, are calculated. The maximum discharge rate is, is less uh, ambiguous how to calculate it, so I will skip it. You have the extracted parameters calculated in the table that is uh, fully accessible to you. You can observe the, the distributions this uh, time of the experimental data. You can observe the very same plots uh, of the increase in discharge rate. You can see that there is something going on that that yes, uh, the maximum discharge rate is much higher than the discharge rate at the recruitment. But now you can go on the quest and see whether or not you can fit this behavior by taking the discharge rate and the recruitment threshold as a fixed factors, right? Again, you see the, the, the black asterisk in the two, 3D plot coming from different motor units, cumulative plot across all the subjects. And you can go and start fitting the data. What you will see here is that you don't have the grand truth. You see already from the residual plots that this very simple model does not explain everything. So there is a structure here, there is a structure here, there is deviation of the quantile plots. 
There are all the hints. You can do the same analysis in the R Studio plus outlier analysis, and you can go on and on. And what you will learn when you do all these uh, examples that we provided for you is that no matter what you do, you can get rid of the pattern in the in the residual plot. So there is a, a circle like behavior. You can get of the time structure here to get rid of this, but this is certainly not a, a Gaussian distribution. <coughs> this is some another distribution. And then the, the quantile plots tell you this. So you need to go beyond the linear mixed models. You need to go to the generalized linear mixed models or to the Bayesian framework in order to, to fully explain what is going on. Since we are running out of time, I will leave this as a homework. Let me just quickly comment that in contrast to the synthetic case where we said, OK, the main dynamics come from the recruitment threshold, the experimental data from 19 subjects say no recruitment threshold is not an important fixed factor <clears throat> at least not in a standalone addition the recruitment discharge rate is a significant factor intercept is a significant factor and the recruitment threshold comes into the significance when you take into account the interaction between the recruitment discharge rate and the recruitment threshold and both MATLAB and the R Studio agree if you take linear mixed models into account. And uh, yeah, they cannot yet agree when you take the Bayesian linear regression into account because this kind of complexity cannot be modeled uh, uh, in the MATLAB when it comes to the Bayesian linear framework. Okay. And you can see here the grouping of the motor unit random effect per subject, something that I discussed before. This is quite complex model, and uh, this one will be a challenge for 19 subjects. You will see some convergence problems, and you have some tips how to address these convergence problems in the very scripts that we provided for you. To wrap up because I am terribly behind the schedule. There is still a question and answer session to be supported. Model assumptions are very important, but they are not easy to reach, at least in experimental conditions. Visual checks of the model assumptions requires experience. So therefore we believe that practicing on the synthetic cases is beneficial for the uh, beginners. Uh, there are different programming languages that come with the different support to linear regression models. RStudio, MATLAB, Python, uh, yeah, JASP or YASP is uh, a very simple one to use, but to our, to our understanding, it has not uh, reached the, the popularity yet. Uh, there are different schools of thinking. Well, there are issues with the installations of, of uh, packages, but I think this is the list of the problem. There are different schools of thinking. One go with the linear mix effect models, the others go with the Bayesian linear regression. Um, you can read a lot about the, this too. I'm being practical here. Uh, I think that in many, many cases, both of them can tell you a lot. Uh, but it all depends on on how well you can how well you master the interpretation of the results that they offer, right? It doesn't help if you go to the Bayesian linear regression if you don't know how to interpret the results and how to master the model assumption checking. I skipped the the issue of comparing the, the models in the scripts. Let me go here in the script. Nina prepared you the way how to compare different models. So 
compare model six to model five, and you will see that this basically, the, these comparisons basically gives you two, two cost functions. One is called AIC. This is Akaike um, uh, information criterion. And the other is BIC. This is bias information criterion. And these are the cost functions. So when you compare two models, which one better fitted your data, the lower values are those that are better. And you can use this uh, indexes to compare which model fits better. These are cost functions. When it comes to the Bayesian linear regression model, a very, very similar um, methodology, but the cost functions have a different name. They are widely applied uh, information criteria and the loop. Again, the lower number, the lower cost value gives you a better fit of the model. So you can sort these models according to the to the uh, these cost functions. Hopefully you can play with this on the simulated data that we provided and that uh, this will help you understand uh, what you can do to read this uh, these cost functions. I end up with the literature uh, overview. Uh, these are the manuscripts that Nina and I like the most. There is a very, very nice uh, introduction for the for the um, for this one is a very nice one. Uh, Bayesian linear regressions with clinical data. This one is the one mentioning the violations of the uh, assumptions uh, by linear mixed effects. So there are a lot of very nice uh, literature. This is the uh, environment STEM, which is compatible with the R and the MATLAB so that you can use. And what is left for me is just once more to invite you for the workshop next week. You can observe the program of the workshop uh, on the web page and on these slides. And once again to the summer school. And finally, I am done. Uh, quite behind the schedule, but now um, I remain available for all potential questions that you might have. Nina, you are now the boss of the question and answer session. Okay, so if you have any questions, maybe just type them into chat and I will read them out and Alash and I can answer them. Can try to answer them, right? Um, I apologize while we are waiting. I apologize again for, for stealing all the time. Um, I kind of expected this will happen. That's why we are uh, we are basically treating this as an introduction, right? So we will open up a forum so that you will be able to to answer, to ask the questions, and then uh, someone will try to answer. Again, neither Nina nor I have a statistical background. We are two people that learned how to do it by doing it, and we are still learning how to do it, right? So uh, the, the target population behind this one, this webinar is a, a gentle introduction into um, and and uh, invitation for the discussion of, of potential problems. And this is what we tend to support. I believe there will be uh, much greater experts with us next week in Barcelona, the one that have much longer experience with the statistical uh, tools. Um, somehow, I wanted to, to do this uh, uh, gently and then um, in that form, maybe we can we can employ the real experts when it comes to the, the statistical questions. Uh, so that's why an engineer explaining the statistics in this webinar. OK. Any question, Nina? No, so far, no. OK. 
our time is almost up. Uh, once again, um, keep tracking us. Uh, Everything that uh, that uh, was lectured today will be available online on on the YouTube channel. We will uh, provide the link to this uh, YouTube channel on the web page. Uh, visit, type Hybrid Neuro in whatever browser you want, and and uh, it should find it. Visit the web page. Uh, go under the the products uh, under the the results. Sorry of the project project. Uh, there will you will find the workshops, you will find summer schools, you will find uh, webinars, and under the valid, uh, data validation uh, webinar, you will have all the material uh, discussed today. With this, I thank you very very much for your attention, and I wish you a pleasant rest of the day or a good working week ahead of us. Thank you for your attention.